Our primary goal for this webinar is to increase awareness of PCD among medical providers. PCD is a rare disease, but these patients are likely presenting in our clinics. Our main goals for today are to recognize the classic symptoms of PCD, to discuss the available diagnostic testing for PCD, and to review the management. As a means of general introduction, PCD is a rare genetic disease. It affects cilia function throughout the body. And the classic symptoms for PCD focus on chronic otosinopulmonary symptoms. You can arrive at a diagnosis of PCD through ciliary biopsy, genetic testing, nasal nitric oxide screening. As you can see by the numbers on this slide, PCD is not really that rare when compared to these other rare genetic diseases. The established prevalence is in the range of 1 to 10,000 to 1 in 30,000 individuals. Most importantly, roughly 1,000 cases of PCD have been diagnosed in North America. However, based on this prevalence, we would anticipate that greater than 20,000 cases should be identified in North America. Let's start thinking about the PCD clinical phenotype in the form of a question. Which of the following is the least common clinical sign or symptom of PCD? A. Chronic cough. B. Chronic nasal congestion. C. Situs inversus. D. Neonatal respiratory distress. Or E. Recurrent otitis. I'll give you a second to think about the answer. And the answer is C. Situs inversus. Many of us learn about ciliary dysfunction in the setting of organ laterality defects, or maybe we learned about it in the setting of Cartagener syndrome. But actually, the other answers on this question are, are much more common than organ laterality defects. Chronic cough and chronic nasal congestion are present in 80 to 90% of people with PCD. 75% of people with PCD have a history of neonatal respiratory distress, as we'll talk about more in this webinar. And recurrent otitis is very common as well. But again, only 50% of people with PCD have an organ laterality defect. Thinking about the cases we just discussed, we can now think about classic symptoms of the clinical phenotype of PCD. Evidence has shown there are major clinical criteria for PCD diagnosis, including unexplained neonatal respiratory distress, any organ laterality defect, daily year-round wet cough starting in the first year of life, and daily year-round nasal congestion also starting in the first year of life. Motor cilia line the airway surface where they are important in beating, beating in a coordinated fashion to sweep dust and microbes and bacteria and virus out of our airway every day. This is what prevents us from getting pneumonia. When these cilia don't work right for people with PCD, this results in impaired airway secretions. This, this gives patients with PCD a year-round wet cough. It gives them frequent lower respiratory tract infections. And the common pathogens identified in people with PCD are the same pathogens that we frequently see in other patients, such as Haemophilus influenza, Strep pneumo, and Moraxella. However, patients with PCD can also have more rare bacteria, such as Pseudomonas. All of this frequent lower respiratory tract infection can lead to end airway damage known as bronchiectasis. These same motor cilia also line our sinus passages and create chronic nasal congestion. They also can result in increased inflammation that gives nasal polyps as well as chronic sinusitis. And these motor cilia are also present in the middle ear where dysfunction can result in frequent ear infections and, and hearing loss. As discussed earlier in this presentation, neonatal respiratory distress is common in individuals with PCD. Chest X-ray results can be variable, however, commonly involve lobar collapse seen here. Now that we've talked about the clinical phenotype of PCD, we're going to talk more about the available diagnostic testing. The guidelines would suggest that when two or more of the major clinical criteria are present, that it is reasonable to pursue PCD-specific diagnostic testing. There are four different diagnostic testings that we're going to now review. Ciliary electron micrograph is classically known as the gold standard for PCD diagnosis. It specifically looks for defects in ciliary ultrastructure. Ciliary biopsy can be done either nasally or taken from lower airway samples. While ciliary biopsy can be very helpful in getting to a diagnosis of PCD, there are some challenging with this diagnostic modality. First, a ciliary biopsy can be normal in up to 30% of patients with PCD. In addition, 
the procedure for obtaining a ciliary biopsy can be challenging and invasive and involves some challenges in processing the sample. Furthermore, in order to get an accurate diagnosis, you need to see many unique cilia in cross-section. In addition, it's most ideal to collect a ciliary biopsy when a patient is at their baseline. Our understanding of the genetics of PCD is rapidly evolving. Initially, PCD was diagnosed genetically based on one known gene. Today, there are 39 known genes associated with PCD. The majority of these genes are available on commercial testing. Most are inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern. It's important to note that you need two mutations in the same PCD-causing gene. Two mutations in two different genes that both cause PCD does not cause PCD. Our available testing now accounts for greater than 60% of PCD cases. High-speed video microscopy is another modality that evaluates the function of the cilia. It is difficult to perform and considerable experience is required. It's important to note again that patients should be at baseline and that abnormalities in ciliary waveform can be present in other scenarios outside of PCD. Thus, clinical context is important. Nasal nitric oxide testing is a promising new modality for the diagnosis of PCD. As we've already discussed, in patients with PCD, nasal nitric oxide levels are characteristically very low. This testing is most reliable in individuals five years of age and older, as we understand the normative data in this age group the best. However, there is still utility in younger patients. This testing has been proven to be very sensitive, and it's not invasive testing. It's a simple maneuver, and most patients can figure it out pretty easily. Unfortunately, at this time, nasal nitric oxide is limited to the research setting and available at PCD clinical centers. This, this slide demonstrates a typical setup of the nasal nitric oxide equipment seen on the left side of the screen. And on the top right hand corner, you can see a child performing a characteristic resistor maneuver for nasal nitric oxide testing. In this setup, the patient is blown into a resistor which creates pallet closure and then allows for the sampling of the level of nitric oxide in the sinus cavity. Then, on the analyzer, this produces a plateau from which the nitric oxide level can be measured. Like other testing modalities, nasal nitric oxide does have its difficulties. You can get false positives if there's a recent nosebleed or acute respiratory tract infection. You do need to rule out cystic fibrosis as individuals with CF also have low nitric oxide values. Furthermore, this is not standardized in children under age of five. So in summary, as we look at these diagnostic modalities, let's keep in mind the following chart. You need two or more of the major clinical criteria previously discussed, in addition to at least one of the following confirmatory tests. Diagnostic ciliary electron micrograph, biallelic mutations in one PCD-associated gene, persistent and diagnostic ciliary waveform abnormalities, or nasal nitric oxide with plateau of less than 77 nanoliters per minute on at least two occasions, two months apart, again with CF excluded. For people with PCD, the mainstay of their treatment is good quality airway clearance. For most patients, this is done at least daily, if not twice a day. These regimens also often include albuterol and hypertonic saline, followed by a device modality such as a vest or an acapella device. Of note, at this time, Dornase Alpha is not routinely recommended for the treatment of patients with PCD. As we've also already discussed, patients with PCD need frequent ear infections and need close follow-up with an otolaryngologist. PE2 placement is very common and hearing evaluations are also needed. It's also not uncommon for our younger patients with PCD to have some speech delay. Sinus interventions are also important. Nasal steroids are sometimes employed but it's also not uncommon for people with PCD to need sinus surgery. As we just mentioned, people with PCD need close follow-up, and this includes close follow-up with a pulmonologist, usually two to four times a year, as well as frequent visits with ENT. However, it's also very important that people with PCD have close follow-up with their primary care provider. In addition, other subspecialists are sometimes needed in the management of people with PCD. 
While we have begun to understand a great deal about the treatment needs of individuals with PCD, further research is certainly needed. For example, there's no current medication to address the dysfunction and correct the dysfunction of the cilia in PCD. There's also no consensus on PCD exacerbation management, when to use antibiotics, and particularly when to admit to the hospital. And there are no guidelines on specific respiratory pathogens such as pseudomonas. This map identifies the multiple care centers available through the PCDF Clinical and Research Centers Network. They are available to you for referral for evaluation and management of PCD patients and continues to expand. It is the goal of the PCD Foundation and its clinical centers to improve the care and expand research for individuals with PCD.